Hello, and welcome to Stuff We Play, home of everything weird and retro. I'm James, but if you've been subscribed for a while, you probably know that. But what you might not know is that last week was actually the fourth year anniversary of the channel. Yeah, it's uh, officially turned four on April 16th. Kind of crazy to think about that. Especially seeing how the, the content's changed over the past few years. You know, I've gone from being a Game Chasers Retro Liberty ripoff to doing documentaries uh, or documentary style videos, buying guides. And then with this, this video, something that's either going to be a one-off or might become a regular thing once I have the space to do more videos like this. Really, that's going to depend on what you think about this video. This Nintendo 64 restoration that I did last year. That's why I'm doing this intro bit now, both to commemorate the time when this video is going out, and also just give a heads up as to, hey, there's a reason why when we get into the, the body of the video itself, uh, my hair will be shorter, I'll have a beard, and on a couple of occasions I'll mention things as being recent that are actually nearly a year old at this point. This is something that I enjoy doing, it's something that involved a console that uh, I've since given to a friend of mine who wanted an N64 for a long while, and I'm glad they are enjoying it greatly. And I hope that you greatly enjoy this video. So let's get right into it. So I recently did a Nintendo 64 buying guide, and that was cool uh, because I got to talk about my memories of the system and ultimately uh, still recommended buying one nowadays because I just think it's a great console. But uh, as you also saw, I own a region modded Pikachu N64. And though when I was younger, I was really into collecting console variants, I don't see the need to own uh, the standard black N64 anymore. But my friend Rose actually would really uh, like an N64. And I've also figured out if I fix this up, I'll also just give it to her along with a copy of Ocarina of Time. So I figured I'd do something a bit different, uh, mainly because I've been binging the 8-bit guy lately, along with Retro Man Cave. And let's restore this N64, let's clean it up, get the dust out. It was in storage in my parents' place for a while. Uh, it seems to have some sort of weird gunk over by the video out port. And also, while we're at it, let's cut off the tabs inside the cartridge slot, and let's region mod it. I, I guess I'll call this Stuff We Restore. Yeah. This is my childhood, Nintendo 64. Now, when I say childhood, I actually mean it's from when I first got into retro gaming as a young teenager. Though I have many fond memories of the N64 from when I actually was a kid, all of my childhood memories of the system stem from playing the likes of Rampage, Vigilante 8, Pokemon Stadium, and various WWE games while at the homes of various childhood friends. I didn't actually own a Nintendo console of my own until that Christmas when I got a GameCube. So, what made this N64 so alluring to me, though, was that when I picked this one up in around early 2011, it was dirt cheap. I got this system, the orange controller shown here, and a copy of Pokemon Stadium, all together for around $15 at a garage sale. Admittedly, though, I didn't always treat my consoles with as much TLC as I do now. See that weird gunk in the AV out port? Vaseline. At one point around 2013, the AV cables that had come with my console began to not work on occasion. So, instead of thinking that there was something wrong with the cord itself, my first thought, being the dumb teenager that I was, was to assume that there was just something wrong with the console itself. So, I did a quick Google search, and one site said that if there was an issue with the AV cables, that I just needed to apply Vaseline to the AV out port to help the connection. A few years later, the AV cables stopped working altogether, and when I got a new set from a local game store, the display issues I was having went away altogether. As we can also see now, there is a lot of gunk on the system, particularly in the vents and in areas such as a jumper pack slot. I wouldn't be surprised if some of this dust and dirt has been on here since the late 90s. That said, 
At the very least, even despite the years of abuse, the front of this console and the controller ports, on first look anyways, appear to be quite clean. With that out of the way, let's shift to my makeshift workbench, what I've set up on the kitchen counter in my humble townhouse. The first thing we need to do in order to open up this system is to remove both the expansion port cover and a set of six screws. All six use the standard odd-shaped screws that are found in most Nintendo consoles, and as such, I've left an Amazon link in the description below for anyone following along at home who doesn't already have such a needed screwdriver. In the process of opening up this console, we'll also find that the two feet on the front of the console have these little plastic pieces that are attached to them. One of them also seems to have some sort of crap on it as well. We'll go ahead and wash those later on along with the rest of the console. Following that, it's time to remove the jumper pack. And yes, the port cover for that too is disgusting. Another one for the cleaning pile there. Now it's finally time to lift off the top of the console. And as we can see, there appears to be some sort of gunk on the large metal piece inside. Though the system was confirmed to work no problem before this video and there are no stains on the outer shell, I wonder if someone spilled a pop on it at some point. That could perhaps explain the spots on this large metal piece. For now though, let's move on to that top lid. That, too, is dirty and in need of a clean. First, let's remove the cartridge slot doors and the slot spacer. This is actually the bit that's responsible for the region locking, since all region locking on the N64 is done through hardware means, not software. Though all of this will get a thorough clean later, this spacer piece will be especially important. One thing to note going forward is that all additional screws, plus the screws from the cartridge doors, are Phillips head screws and not game bit screws. Though I don't think I'll need to leave a link for a Phillips head screwdriver below. Also, keep in mind in my case that some of these screws were a bit of a pain to remove. Some of them even showed traces of gunk on them, and I really don't know what this stuff is so I'll just keep calling it gunk. One other thing that you may notice throughout this video is that, yes, I actually did remove a few more screws than I needed to in order to remove the technical bits from the bottom part of the shell. Thankfully though, due to keeping my screws properly separated in a safe spot off camera, this didn't lead to any issues. For those following at home, I've also left a link below to a pill organizer, as those are actually wonderful for holding screws and other small bits while cleaning and restoring consoles. After all of that is done, the main board just lifts out and we're shown what lies underneath. I'm honestly a bit relieved that there's no dead bugs or anything lying at the bottom of the case, just a bit more dirt and grime that I'll wash off easily in the sink. On that note, I'm now armed with soap and water for cleaning the plastic bits in the sink and compressed air and 99% isopropyl alcohol for cleaning the main board by hand. So now, in a nod to the retro future, I'm proud to present you with a cleaning montage. As a final touch once the plastic pieces were set out to dry, I also took a moment to use some of the isopropyl alcohol to clean the contacts on both the jumper pack and the Ocarina of Time cartridge. After all, both of those bits just came from a local value village and aren't things I've had since I was a teenager. 
Now, I know some of you are wondering about how I'd go about removing the tabs from the cartridge slot spacer so as to make my console region free. After all, those tabs are the only thing keeping cartridges from, say, Japan or Australia from fitting into the cartridge slot properly. Well, in an ideal world, I'd use a Dremel to finally remove them. But this is not an ideal world, and I don't have any such power tools on hand right now. Instead, we must turn to the quick and dirty method, forcibly ripping out the tabs with pliers. For those of you who don't wish to see cartridge slot mutilation, shield your eyes. After that though, it's just a matter of reassembling the system through an inverse of the steps it took to disassemble it. This brings me to my last restoration tip for the video. Taking photos of your system's mainboard before you start disassembling it is always a good idea. But anyways, with that, let's take a look at the finished restoration. Doesn't it look beautiful? It almost looks like a brand new system, and that modified cartridge slot means that games from any region can now be played on it. To prove that, let's try out the Japanese version of Pokemon Stadium on this newly modded American N64. Job well done, you bearded internet man, you. So I think this has actually turned out quite well. As we saw in that very, uh, I guess, low quality-esque um, showcase, it's not only works, but it works splendidly with games from any region, whether they be US or Japanese. I unfortunately don't have any PAL games to try on it. This was something different. Let me know if you enjoyed it. Or if you have any tips on how to say streamline this process in the future. Maybe if I actually got a proper table uh, in my film setup. Because right now I just have this. And this is not big enough. Maybe I, it's about time I invest a nice folding table. But this was fun. Thank you very much for watching. Stay classy. If you enjoyed this or if you found this felt helpful. Definitely share it out with the world. Because every view does count. And I'll see you next time.